Correct. Like Boston Brass 2 has a paper that makes it. No, my brain is wrong. Like, I'm using your Easter Sunday. I need to think about it. Well, I'm not going to be wrong. 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 Go take the matter even says Easter Monday. According to the WSC Student Affairs calendar, there should not be classes the Monday right after. So that means we won't be having, at least I won't be here. So this unit, um, I was not able to get to this unit last spring because COVID broke out. So, um, but this is normally the third and final unit for uh, Theory 2. And I'm excited about it that we get to do it in this class because it starts us talking about chromatic harmony. Chromatic chords. These are chords that contain pitches that do not fit in the key in which they're found, right? Okay, so um, we're going to be talking about those all the way up until Easter break. And then after that, we're going to start something called modulation, which is how to change key in the middle of a musical passage or in the middle of a piece. And that's super interesting and very important too. So very critical uh, topics coming up here. You can see on the back side of this sheet, tentatively, our third test is Friday, April 23rd. And then after that, there's no more new, new material. All we do is just review for the final exam. So I usually have, uh, if I can fit them in, I usually have one more test towards the end of the semester. And then whatever days are left and there's nothing new to learn, is just review for one more final exam. Okay, so that's kind of how it's laid out. Um, I'll let you know if I have any changes. Otherwise, hang on to this one. You can discard the other one, or you can put an X through it so you don't look at that one anymore. Or you can save it in a scrapbook, or you can refer it to your dorm room wall, or something. Whatever you want to do, that's fine. <laughs> Alright, so as usual, when we start a brand new topic, it, it takes a lot of uh, explaining, it takes a lot of concentration and effort to kind of get it off the ground. And that's kind of where we are today. Uh, we're going to be talking about some chromatic chords. And I'm hoping that, I mean, I don't want to, I would rather not talk the whole time, but there's a lot I need to explain, and I'm hoping like by five or ten minutes before the end of class, we can start by looking at some practical examples out of the book, so you know how to do your first assignment based to out of the workbook. But, yeah, the first, you can, well, I already put it away. You can see the first assignment that's due on the one that's due Friday, it's all in the workbook for next time. So. Uh, I will use, I'll try to use these examples a little bit later. I think you can use them right at this moment. Okay, let's talk about what does the word chromaticism mean? You know what chromatic means in music or chromaticism means in music? Does it mean something along the lines of like traveling by, like, step? Okay, yeah, certainly when we move, when a line moves by uh, chromatically, I guess we could say, it moves by a half step. That's one way that we can define something that's chromatic. Definitely. Chromatic refers to half steps. In this case, chromaticism, the way I'm going to use it, it refers to the use of pitches in a musical passage that do not belong to the key of that passage. So for instance, if I'm in the key of C major, and in a melody or in a harmony or somewhere in C major, okay. oh no, this is, sorry, this is baseball. But can you imagine that you're in C major and you come across or you encounter an F sharp? What on earth? Doesn't make any sense, right? F sharp doesn't belong in C major. How do we explain that? And you know, there's a lot of pitches in music that are chromatic, in other words, Basically, very often, you look at any piece of music and chances are it's going to have some notes that do not belong to the key that that piece is in or that passage is in. Okay? 
when a chord contains one or more chromatic pitches, we call a chord a chromatic chord. So for instance, if I'm in C major still, and I get C this F sharp, and it's being used in the context of a D major triad, it still doesn't really make a lot of sense to us at this point. What on earth, what incarnation is a D major triad doing? being sounded or being used in a C major piece or a C major passage. It doesn't fit, it doesn't belong there. But the rule is, basically the guideline is, as long as you have a chord that contains a minimum of one pitch, one chromatic pitch, one pitch that does not belong in the key, we say that the entire chord is called a chromatic chord. <clears throat> Another word for a chromatic chord. And I won't use this term, but I think your book uses this term. But another term that means the same thing is the word, the phrase altered chord. I will use probably this, this term a lot more often. But they mean the same thing. A chromatic chord is an altered chord, and an altered chord is one that contains at least one chromatic chord, one accidental one chromatic pitch so that it doesn't belong in the key. And, oh, bless you. By the way, we're going to find out, too, that, I don't know if this, this is, this chord is not, is not going to be analyzed in capital two <laughs> in C major. Absolutely not. Yeah, we never write capital twos. We'll find out what they call it in a little while. Okay. The most commonly encountered chromatic chord or altered chord in music is called a secondary chord. And there's another synonymous term for a secondary chord. The book uses this uh, sometimes. I don't really use this term. But another synonym for a secondary chord is something called an applied chord. They mean the same thing. And once again, I'll probably use the first term primarily. So the most common chromatic chord encountered in music is something called a secondary chord. And secondary chords occur in all types and styles of music. Maybe you just didn't realize it, or you won't realize it until a little bit later. But, I mean, you talk about classical music, you talk about pop music, Broadway music, Choir music, band music, jazz music, doesn't matter. Secondary chords occur in all those kinds of music. They're just that common or that frequent. <clears throat> now we have to define what a secondary chord is. I suppose I can try to write it out here because it's kind of important to go back to this basic definition. A secondary chord is a chord with dominant function. It has to have a dominant function. But the dominant function, its dominant function is applied to a chord other than the dominant. Right now we should be very used to dominant chords progressing to tonic chords, like a 5 going to a 1. That's what a dominant chord does, right? What it does, it's, what it's, it's characteristic and known and designed to do is that its root is supposed to drop or fall a fifth to the root of the chord it goes to. 5 goes to 1, the root comes down a fifth, so we can get the root to the chord.
chords that act like a 5 or a 5 7 in their spelling and in their resolution, but when they resolve to a chord that is not tonic. These types of chords are called secondary dominants. Secondary dominants. So there's only a few kinds of secondary chords, and one of the main uh, groups is something called a secondary dominant. And that's what we're going to focus on for several days here. Kind of a quick way to think about it is it's going it's going to be a dominant chord of a, of a it's going to be a dominant of a chord that is not tonic. It's like saying it's a five of something other than what. By the way, um, let me just, I guess over on the side before I get back to this, what types of triads are five chords? Are they major, minor, augmented, or diminished triads always? They're always major triads, right? Yeah. And we focused on this lately too. How about the five seven chord, which also has dominant function? What type of seven chord is it always? Dominant seventh, yeah. <laughs> no, he's right, but um, what's another way to say it? Is it like a major major or minor? Yeah. It's a major minor seventh chord. Yes, always. That's right. Okay. So, in this measured example here, I've got a G chord that's resolving or progressing to a C chord. And in C major, that's just a five triad going to a one chord. But, Look at this measure down here. I have the same two chords that I had up above, but they're in a different key. And because they're in a different key, the first chord here, the G chord, is a chromatic chord. Why is this called a, considered a chromatic chord, the F? Well, because it contains a pitch that doesn't belong in F major, namely the B natural. So I can analyze this chord over here, the second or the resolution chord. I can analyze that and have no problem, right? How would you analyze a C and G in F major? What real numeral would you give C and G? Yeah, a right? But right now, at this moment, I don't have really a way or a, to give this chord an accurate label. I don't know what to call it in F major. But because this chord, GBD, is, is resolving to a harmony other than tonic, but it's resolving in the same way that a regular dominant goes to tonic, that is, its root is falling a fifth, this is called a secondary dominant. And I guess what I can, should say is that this chord, I would say, is a secondary dominant of, it's a dominant of, the true five chord in F major. Okay. So I'm in F major, and C E G is really the true, the true genuine five chord. But because this chord is being preceded by its dominant, and that's a good way to explain why this chromatic pitch is in here, then I'm going to label this chord as saying it's a dominant of the true dominant. Or you could say that it's a five chord of the real five chord. This is your primary five chord. This is a five chord of your primary five chord. And the way we label that in music is with a symbol like this. Five slash five. And the symbol is, the label is read as five slash is read as of. So rather than calling this G B natural D chord a capital two in F major, that doesn't really reflect or represent the chord's behavior or reason or function for being there. The reason this chord with the B natural, the chromatic chord that doesn't fit exactly in the key, the reason it's there is because it's embellishing and emphasizing the chord that follows it. 
So we're going to say the chord that follows it is the thing that's most important. And that's the one that fits into the key, naturally. It's just that once we know what this is, we can go back and say, oh, this is just a dominant chord on this. And it only happens, you know, secondary dominance, you know, is only this or two chord process, and that's it. Generally, you have chords coming before this that are all in F major, and chords after this one here that are all in F major. It's just a real brief temporary thing that you get this color, you know, a different flavor with the chromatic that you get that chord in, in music. So, for instance, I could say, like, in C major, I could say that this, D, F, A, that is a regular, that's your normal two chord in C major. But let's just think now, this is a D minor triad. Let's just think outside the box. If you were in D minor, how would you spell D minor's octave? What notes would you use? If you were in D minor, how would you spell a five chord? Can you think of that? The root would be A, C sharp. So I can use that chord. I can use the dominant of D minor, but put it in the key of C major. A, C sharp, E. And when I use that chord in the key of C major, it doesn't fit in the key. I'm not going to call this a capital six. Because its function is really to be a dominant of this one. So I would label this chord actually as a five of a two chord in the case of C major. Yeah. So whenever you're putting a secondary dominance to the chord, that would be the second, five or two or a half. Yes. Okay. So I think what she's saying is that the, the Roman numeral to the right of the slash in this secondary chord label, that's the chord that it's always going to go to. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. You are correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I don't want to dwell too long on that because I want to make sure I get through this. I should mention that because tonic chords, regular true tonic chords, like one chords, they're either major or minor only. Right? I mean, we would never, in music, we would never write like one diminished. Oh, that's garbage. Tonic chords, since they're only either major chords or minor chords, that means it makes sense that only a major chord or a minor chord can be preceded by its own dominant. So these secondary dominants, five of something, you're never to the right of the slash, it's never going to be like a five of an augmented triangle. Or it's never going to be a five of a diminished triad. Because augmented and diminished triads, they can't sound like they're receiving motion from the dominant. They can't sound like a tonic even for a brief moment. Only major and minor triads have that ability. You would never have a piece, for instance, and, well, at least not in tonal music, you'd never have a piece end on an augmented triad or a diminished triad. It's always going to end on a major. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that with these secondary dominant labels, you know, you would never have something like this. Because, I don't, I don't know, if I, I, don't, I don't want to crumble it or complicate it anymore. But just know that the chord, the Roman numeral to the right of the slash with these symbols is always going to be a major triad or a minor triad. When this whole process happens, the non-tonic chord, that is, in this case, the two chord, it sounds kind of like it's emphasized or like it's mo more important just for a moment. And do you know why it sounds like it's more important than just the plain J two chord? It sounds more important than, because it's being preceded by its dominant. And every time we hear dominant whose root falls a fifth to something, it sounds like, hey, that's kind of important because we're so used to hearing 5 to 1, 5 to 1, 5 to 1. And so maybe just for a brief moment, or I should say just temporarily for this two chord 
the span of these two chords. When this happens, the two chord, even though it's not tonic, it kind of sounds like it could be just for a brief moment because it's being preceded by its own tonic. It's being preceded by its body. And when this happens, the process of making a chord that is not tonic briefly sound more important, like almost like it is tonic for a moment, that whole process is something called tonicization. And don't type that into your word program because it will put it in red and say misspells. Tonicization is the event or the process, what happens when a non-tonic chord is briefly made to sound like tonic or more important by virtue of its being preceded by its dog. That's what tonicization is. And when a non-tonic harmony like this too, or when it is tonicized by its own dominant here, the key of the music does not change. We don't change the key signature or key of the music to make this be like a five and a one that fits in D minor. We don't do that. Because we don't have to. We can just say, for the moment, the regular two chord in C is being preceded by its own dominant, and that's how we explain why that chromatic chord is there. The whole tonicization process involves just two chords. The secondary dominant itself, and then the chord it goes to to make it temporarily sound like tonic, even though it isn't. talk a little bit more, and then I'm going to give you a, a, a pass around a hand out of the sheet that's got a, what I think is a pretty clear example of a use of a secondary dominant. Let's think of, let's think of, going back to why on earth are there, why are there chromatic pitches? Why are there pitches that do not belong to the, the, the main prevailing key when we spell a secondary dominant? Well, if you precede a non-tonic chord with its own five, that's where the chromatic pitches generally come in. It makes sense that the dominant of a chord other than tonic will contain notes that do not belong to the prevailing tonic key, right? If you have a dominant of a chord that's not tonic, this chord is bound to have some pitch, the pitch or pitches that do not belong to the prevailing key because it's not a five of the tonic key. Okay? And by the way, I must stress again that these secondary dominants are always major triad or major minor seventh chords. They have to be, you have to use whatever accidentals are necessary in your given key to make them major triad or major minor seventh chords. Those exact types. All right. So since secondary dominants don't belong to the key in which they're found, accidentals must be added or used to make them major triads or major minor seven chords, and that's why they're called chromatic chords. Chromatic chords. Okay. Let's let's just look at that passage. I need to take a break and talk to you guys. I always go back to this song. It's a good illustration. <coughs> Well, we've talked about pop symbols. 
And let me tell you, out of all the chords that are in boxes or rectangles or squares on this page, there is one and only one that does not fit normally in C major. In other words, there's only one chord on this page that contains a note or some notes that don't fit in C major. Can anyone look at the pop symbols and tell me which one doesn't fit? The D symbol. That's the only one that doesn't naturally fit in C major. All the other chords contain all pitches from the scale C major. But the D7 chord does not. In fact, it contains one pitch that does not fit in C major. And let's take a look at that. Does anyone know what, uh, what, what four notes are a D7? A, D, I. Good, F sharp, A, and C. That's a major minor seventh chord. And you see how it contains one pitch. It doesn't belong in C major. So we have to have a way to explain this chord, to label this chord. And rather than calling it something like a capital super 2-7 or something like that, which doesn't reflect its function really, its behavior, its purpose for being. What we're going to say is the D7 chord is actually going to function in relation to the chord that comes after it. That's its reason for being there. To ornament, embellish, or decorate and kind of elevate the sound or the status of the chord that follows it. And looking at the chord that follows, what, what is the chord that follows the D7? The G chord. Now, can we analyze a G chord in the key of C with a Roman numeral? Yes, it would be what we need. Five, yeah. The G chord is the true five. Now, backing up to the chromatic chord, the one that contains a pitch that doesn't belong in C, can I give that part, that harmony a Roman numeral or a label that uh, labels it in relation to its purpose to this chord? The answer is yes, I can label it in relation to this chord. Because is not, think about the root D. Is not D a perfect fifth above G? And if I was in G major, wouldn't this be the chord's label? If I was in G major, I would call it D7 a 5 7. But I'm not in G major. I'm in C major. So I have to say that the D7 chord is actually a 5 7, not a tonic, but a what? Of the five chord that comes after, yeah. So technically, the truth, the right label to label the D7 in C major is to call it a 5 7 of the real five. It's a secondary dominant seven. The 5 7 of the five. And I'll go to the piano and play this in a moment. Maybe you'll notice that all of those nice chords that are diatonic, that fit in C minor, they're all well and good, right? But when I get to this chord, the one chord that contains one chromatic pitch, it's going to sound like, ooh, wow. It's like it's going to give the whole passage color. So, I, well, I hope you have that reaction. I, I know I did when I first heard it. OK, so we're going to see. Um, 
Okay, so I, don't, I, I hope that this example is kind of clear. I mean, the only way we can label that D7 chord is as a dominant of the real bell. Not as a two, capital 2, 7, but we say it's a 5, 7 of the 5 chord. And that explains why, how, I mean, why it's got a chromatic pitch in it that doesn't belong to C major. Any questions about this so far? I know this is a tough concept to wrap your mind around. But it's, I mean, music is just chock full of secondary dominance. You got, you got to under, eventually understand this concept to understand anything about what goes on in music. Um, okay, so let's go now and start talking about, I mean, you might think, well, what is, how is this practical for me? Well, at least in the immediate, uh, the immediate time frame for the next class, we're going to have to learn how do we spell secondary dominance. Okay? And how do we analyze secondary dominance? How do we know what Roman numerals is written? And there are some nice step-by-step -step instructions in your book, excuse me, on how to do this. And we're going to go through some examples now. Hopefully now you kind of get the concept behind these chords. So now we just kind of have to practic practically spell them and analyze them. If you want to mark a page in your book, two pages in your book, to tell you exactly how to do what we're going to do for homework for Friday, the steps are on page 258 and 259. You can always refer to those two pages to help you do this if you forget. So you have to use whatever accidentals are necessary 
to make your final chord either a major prime, or if it's falling chord seventh chord, a major prime seventh chord. Whatever accidental we're necessary. Let's try another one. Mm, let me see if I can find a good one. I'm just pulling one out of the whole field again. Oh, that was the same thing. Let's try this one. Let's stay in the trouble. step-by-step instructions on how to do that on the bottom of page 258 and the top of page 259 in the book. Step is 
would a major or minor triad built on A fit in this key? And the reason I'm asking that is because remember I got through saying not too long ago that secondary dominance can only tonicize major or minor chords, not diminished and not augmented chords. So if a major or a minor, A major or A minor, if one of those two chords is, fits in the key of G, then everything is satisfied and we can call this a secondary dominant of something. That something exists. So what, what would you say? What, does, a, does a major or minor triad on A fit in G? Which one? A minor, yeah. An A minor triad, what would an A minor triad, what Roman numeral would it be in G? Two. So that means we can say we've checked everything else out. We can say then that this is a five of a two. But what inversion is this for? First inversion, five six of two. That's my final one. What what uh, what's the two chord in the major? Why can't you do that? I know it'll end up. But is, is it because it'll end up diminished? Or? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand. Sorry. Question. So we have to do the uh, the minor two. Yeah. And how can we do? Well, because a major, an A C sharp E chord doesn't fit in G. Oh, so the if, second chord has to fit. Yes, the okay. second chord has to fit exactly. You bet. Uh huh. That's right. Okay, let's do another one. Oh, sorry, question. I was going to ask, if they tried to give us like G minor in this example, would we just write it off, or would they never do that? Oh yeah, if they gave you like a minor triad, you just put an X in the blank because it couldn't be a secondary one. It has to be the major or the minor No, no, I'm, I'm oh, sorry. I was meaning the, like if the overall key was G minor, the dependence would be diminished. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you get that. If you find out that the chord it goes to, the only way to get it to fit in the key would be to make it like diminished or something, then you have to put an X in the blank and just, it could be a secondary dominant, but it can't be a secondary dominant of the chord it's supposed to be because that chord doesn't exist. It doesn't. In fact, let's, let's, I don't know if this one's just like that, but it's, it's very close. Let's try one of these. Um, I'll just do it. Any more going to go to C sharp minor? Yeah. The key of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. The key of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Four sharps in the key signature. And we're in bass clef, and this is the chord that we have to determine, number one, could it be a secondary dominant of something? And if so, what would the label be for? If it can't, excuse me, if it can't be a secondary dominant of support that exists in the key, we have to just put an X in the bottom. All right, let's take a look here. D, F sharp, Right. Is it a major triad or a major minor sum? It's a major triad, right? The F sharp A. Okay, so step one is good. Check. So step two says find the note that's a perfect fifth below the root of this chord. Because if we're going to say it's a five of something, we need to find out what the root of that something is. It would be a five of what? Okay, so a perfect fifth below D is what note? G. And then finally, step three is. Would a major or minor triad built on a G fit into this key of C sharp minor? The answer is no. Because G actual doesn't even fit the law in C sharp. So we kind of got part way. We said, yeah, this could be like a 5 6 of something, but it would be a 5 6 of something that doesn't even exist in C sharp 9 because we've got the wrong pitches. So the overall answer for one like this would be say, no, it can't be a secondary dawn of any kind in this key. It can't be. You 
want to see one? Anyone want to see one? You good? Okay. Anyone want to see one? All right, well then I feel good because we got through spelling and uh, recognizing and analyzing these. So, for Friday, please do in your workbook page 133A and page 134B. Just follow the instructions. I think on page 133A, I think you have to include the specific before you can start spelling the code. So make sure you do that.